I sure hope you're not tired of talk of multiverses and big spoilers for Xenoblades 1 and 2 because we're going right back down into that hole this time. I don't really even have an excuse for it this time. I just happened to find a text box in the Minato secret file that piqued my interest when I was looking through the Minato secret file for something completely unrelated. As in, I was trying to find all the different lines because there were several throughout the book where the developers were like, why yes, we were horny when we thought of Vinaya, thank you for noticing. The phrase spring-loaded breasts is used. So, anyway, this is a fairly innocuous line when viewed from the original context of this book was written and published within a year of Xenoblade 1 coming out, but it gets so much more interesting with added context from Xenoblade 2 and Future Connected. So, this is just at the bottom of a page where they're talking about a bunch of cutscenes. It's literally just a list of all the cutscenes in the game, and this is where the fact that the story is split up into 17 different chapters originally came from. It was something that wasn't actually included in the game, but they knew about it and they had this idea going on since it was originally made. It was mentioned in the secret files and then they decided to actually implement the chapter system into the final release. But basically the last page of that, which is going through the last several cutscenes in the game, which is basically from beating Dixon to the end, and this is also where that really good Kunihiko Tanaka Shulkin Fiora drawing shows up. I'm digressing a lot. We get a little thing on the bottom. Alvis the Absconder. Maineth the mechanical goddess turned into petals. Zanza the organic god was sliced in twain. This is how the two gods of Shulk's world were destroyed. However, what became of Alvis and the Manado that controlled both gods? Here is what Mr. Takahashi has to say. The being who oversees the universe is gone. That means that something made it disappear. It is up to us to find our own explanation. Now, once again, pull yourself back in time a bit. Cast yourself back into an era where Xenoblade 1 is the only game in the series once again. And yeah, this is just a neat little open-ended question that the developers are leaving for us to ponder because not everything needs to be fully explained. Why did Alvis leave in the end? Was it that he was so powerful? He thought that his power could be abused, whether by Shulk or by Descendant or something, or that he in and of himself was too close to be a god for his liking, so he decided to just back away from the universe. Or did something cause him? Is there an issue that just happened to be poofed into existence when Shulk remade the universe that's like 16,000 light years away? All of a sudden, Zanza 2 is about to start his new phase transition experiment, and Elvis decided to go over there and stop it. It could be a bunch of things. Maybe even some new antagonistic force was created that was actually more powerful than Alvis or whatever. It doesn't really matter because this is just an open-ended thing. It's literally up to us to find our own explanation. You choose for yourself what happened after the game. That is all well and good. It's completely okay to have a few things open-ended at the end of a game even if it doesn't get any sequels. As long as the plot itself is wrapped up fine, which I would say Xenoblade once is. But then they had to go and make a Xeno multiverse. And now we have to return to this and, like, actually think about it now that we know just exactly what Alvis is and exactly what may be in store for the universe of Xenoblade Chronicles 1. The funny thing about this is it's actually really easy if you want to go down the directly obvious route of explaining things, and that is we know that Alvis is connected to the conduit now. We saw the conduit go away at the end of Xenoblade 2, ergo Alvis had to go away with it. Except, you know who else is connected to the conduit? Numa. You know who came back at the end of Xenoblade 2 despite the conduit being gone? Pyra and Mithra. So there is that, but there's also the possibility of Alvis, who is a lot more computery than Pyra and Mithra, and honestly, even though I think he does like legitimately like Shulk and the rest of the party, doesn't really have as much tying him to that world or anything. So when he senses the conduit is about to vanish to who knows where, his machinish curiosity kicked in and made him decide to go with it and see where it was going and all that stuff. That's a reasonable explanation. Pure curiosity caused him to want to explore wherever the conduit left to, which, I don't know, could be another universe or something. We might just see him pop up a bit later as, like, yep, Alvis is here, he's a guest from another universe, that means the conduit's showing up. Check your backyard again, guys. It could be that, but I want to theorize about more stuff, because it could sort of possibly get a little more interesting than that. The other thing that I'm going to definitely throw out the window is that the conduit went into the Xenosaga universe, becoming the Zohar there, and then Alvis ended up as Chaos, just because 
Chaos is younger, and he would have to come after Alvis for this to make sense, which really doesn't matter at all. But then there's also Xenosaga's cosmology doesn't match up with that, and none of Chaos's character and background would fit with the character development Alvis has and the decisions he makes flowing naturally into the beginning of that. So that's definitely not the case. They're just two people with a lot of similarities who look like each other as opposed to being the same person, and I'm pretty sure I can guarantee that much. It is also worth pointing out that this is a fan translation, so a certain amount of editorial bent might have been included in this just in order to make it sound good and not just a really dry, this was obviously translated, taken from something in Japanese type thing. Like, Alvis the Absconder, I don't think use of the word abscond really matters too much. I'm pretty sure that's in there just for alliteration. So, there might be a little wiggle room in here, but I'm pretty sure that any post-Xenoblade 1 bias isn't present because as far as I know, the people overseeing the entire secret file translation do not like Xenoblade 2 and do not like associating Xenoblade 1 with Xenoblade 2, so if there's anything even slightly implying Ontos-related shenanigans or Zohar-related shenanigans or the like, if that was put in the translation and was not implicit in the original text, I am like 97% sure it would have gotten the axe and not been allowed in the completed product. So what's there is actually there in the original Japanese. I didn't participate in this fan translation project at all. I know someone who did participate in it and my support of it has been limited to being in the Discord server for the project and literally never speaking and then, like, retweeting the finished thing a couple times. But, regardless, something made Alvis disappear. Something made a supercomputer connected to the conduit disappear. If we go by the interpretation that it wasn't Alvis intentionally stepping back, or the conduit making him disappear, what could even do that? Well, first off, it's something way more powerful than what any of the characters in the one or two universes could handle now that their conduit power is gone. And second off, wow, the Xenoblade 1 universe is now facing an incursion from a new seemingly extra-dimensional threat that isn't handled very well with their conventional weaponry, and I'm pretty sure having something like the Monado around would be able to help out quite a lot. To be fair, we don't actually know whether a conduitless Alvis would actually be able to help out too much. Like, think about it a different way. Pirate and Mithra have come back without the conduit, but in terms of power, are they the same as they were before? Brought down to normal blade strength? Or basically just humans with core crystals? I don't know, but at least someone with the knowledge of Alvis would be pretty helpful if the fog creatures start coming back and that, like, actually becomes an ongoing threat the world has to deal with. But powerful or not, the fact is that if Alvis did not go away of his own volition, he was taken, randomly, and then, within a couple years of him going away in this brand new world, interdimensional rifts start showing up, and the things coming out of them are similar to things both from Xenosaga and from Xenoblade 2. So, this implies something with multiverse traveling capability, something that can at least sort of get around the powers of a Zohar, I don't even know. Is there someone from another universe with their own Zohar just kind of causing trouble as much as possible? Are things starting to come together and collapse? Did some rift in Shulk creating the new universe throw Alvis out somewhere else and bring in basically Gnosis versions of people from Xenoblade 2? I don't really know. The point is that there are things that you can think about regarding this. and. Again, just imagine, there's that one heart-to-heart -heart in Future Connected where Melia's like, Wow, I feel like something really bad is about to start happening to this world, and it's obviously not just the Fog King, because you can only get that heart-to-heart -heart, like right before you fight it, and when you do, it's pretty easy and conclusive that it's gone, at least for the time being, so are more Fog creatures going to show up? Just think about the fact, like, yeah, the Fog King was pretty strong, it was able to damage Alchemoth severely and stuff, but also, once they had the ability to defeat it, it was just a strong enemy. But just imagine a Zanza level threat, or even an Ego level threat, showing up now in that world when people are still rebuilding, even though it's been over a year. And then also just the fact that 
There is no conduit tied anything. There's no Monado. Even if I could see very easily if Alvis was still there and something really strong showed up, there would be a serious conversation where Shulk was, no, I do not want to be a god, but if the power of a god is necessary to protect everyone, I will take that burden up for a small period of time if so necessary. He doesn't have that option right now. They would be completely screwed, like beyond the point of the Homs already almost being wiped out by the Mechon, and then everyone left getting under attack by Zanza and being shoved into Colony 6 and stuff like that. It could get worse from that, and that is a kind of scary thought to think about, honestly. And then again, also, we don't have Numa around. Rex is left with Mithra, and we don't know if Mithra's at full power still, and we definitely know she doesn't have Siren anymore because the artifices were directly powered by the conduit. So Siren definitely isn't working. Ophion definitely isn't working. Depending on how much of their old power remains, Rex and just Mithra is the strongest person in the world, or it's a tie between Morag and Zeke. And Morag and Zeke are both great, but like, if something Ion level shows up again, they're not gonna be able to win. And that's kind of an issue. Like, if we're gonna pull in some spoilers from Gears and Saga, if we're just saying that, yeah, all of these are taking place at the same time in different universes in a multiverse, like, Cosmos is gone. The Zohar in Xenosaga is still around, it still exists in that universe, but, like, Cosmos is by far the most powerful character there. Her and Chaos are both far away from anyone else, so if something encroaching on the multiverse shows up there, Xion and friends are kind of screwed. In X, well, there is no Zohar equivalent. No one really has a huge amount of power in the first place, and, like, humanity's already on their last legs. Also, they're trying to go and find Earth at some point, if they can ever get off of Mira, according to some Lin lines at the end of the game, so that's a different thing. It really comes down to Fei Fong Wong. Like, he's the only person to keep his powers after the Zohar goes away, because, like, Xenogears still works, and Xenogears is already the most powerful mech in the world, so he's still kind of okay. I think Ether might still work, and like everything else is fine. So, yeah, we know Perfect Works Episode 6 was supposed to happen, where some big other issue was going to show up, and they'd go on to the unknown future, but like, at least he can still blow really big things up. Shulk can't do that. Rex can't do that. Elma never really could without a scale, and. Like, you gotta find Cosmos really quickly, Shion, if you want any help. So, yeah, basically, if something is actually capable of yanking Alvis out of his universe, and Melia had a premonition about really bad things happening, then some really, really bad things might actually happen. And for the sake of the characters, I hope Monolith and Square managed to work something out so they could, like, travel to the Xenogears universe, because, man... Faye showing up out of nowhere, popping up out of a Zohar portal, and punching someone out. It might really be the only option some of these universes have left. But yeah, until next time, or at least my next major video, which is going to be about Tyrea finally, I'm really excited to make this. This is Luxon signing off.